The first four verses of this chapter have been described in various ways. Among them, it is a golden paragraph. It's a, a treasured uh, passage. It has sort of a celestial music flowing through it. It is a paragraph, a section that, that lifts up the soul and enables you to see clear all the way through to eternity. And I think all of that is true. But one of the dangers that we have, and it's never helped in a sense by the fact that the translators of the scriptures, and ever since 1550 or so, we've had chapter divisions and we've had verses applied to the text of Scripture. And here, I've started reading at chapter 3 in verse 1. And you might think, if, well, if you're reading a book, one of the things that generally happens when you start a new chapter is you start something that's very fresh, very new. You've been following an incident or one person in the story, the chapter ends and you're in a totally different situation in the next chapter. A different person or events that will be happening at the same time somewhere else. And we get used to that. You start a new chapter, it's something new. But it isn't. The chapter division, even the little paragraph headings have all been added and they break up the flow so that that first paragraph and we will be concentrating upon that first paragraph that first paragraph is not something that stands by itself it has an intimate connection with what with what went before and with what follows afterwards and the fact that it's in that context explains a great deal about the things that Paul is writing, why he's writing it, why he's using these particular words or phrases, and we need to put it in its context. We need to see those connections and not be distracted by the paragraph headings or the chapter divisions. Now we'll see that and I'm going to go through hopping backwards and forwards between chapter 3 and these first few verses and the, the, the things that Paul has written in previous verses and also in some that follow. Now he starts off with the word if. Now if you look back to chapter 2 and verse 20 he's got another paragraph that starts with if. So these two paragraphs separated by our chapter division, really are intimately, very, very closely connected. He's following the same argument, if in chapter 2, verse 20, and if in chapter 3, verse 1. And then we have, no pun intended, the word then. Now the word then, in Greek, is exactly the same word as the word therefore. If you look back to chapter 2 and verse 6, you'll see that starts with the word therefore. Chapter 2, verse 14, sorry, verse 16. Again, therefore. Here in chapter 3, verse 1, chapter 3, verse 5, chapter 3, verse 12, we've got the word then again. So Paul is, is using these little breaks in his argument to say, you've heard me tell you something, I've taught you something, therefore this must happen, or therefore this follows, this is a consequence. If then, and then he goes on to say, you have been raised with Christ. Now if you think about it, that word raised, look back to chapter 2 and verse 12. He was talking about believers then, being raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him, that is Christ, from the dead. He's using the same words. He's showing there is a very close connection. Let's go on to a very favourite, in this particular chapter, in this section, a very favourite phrase of Paul's. You've been raised with Christ. He says that twice in chapter 2 and verse 12. 
And then again in, in verse 13, and then again in verse 20, and he's going to use it again in verse 3 and verse 4 of this chapter. You were uh, buried with him, with Christ in baptism. You were raised with him. You were made alive together with him. With Christ you died. Paul is, is using these phrases repeatedly to build up an immense powerful picture to those who are reading or hearing it. But he goes on. In fact, well, he, he uses the word with the phrase with Christ here, but at the beginning from verse 6 of chapter 2, he uses the words in him, in Christ. So walk in him, be built up in him. In him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you've been filled in him. In him also. Paul is not in these first four verses of chapter 3 starting anything new. Everything is linked to what has gone before. Everything ties in with his argument in previous chapters and not just the, from chapter 2 verse 6 which I've highlighted but other verses going further back as well. So if then you've been raised with Christ and then we have two sections which really are new but are carried on from other implications and at the beginning of verse 3 he says for that's there in chapter 2 and verse 9. Now you might think the word for, well, the last time I was here I, I posed a question and no one came up to me afterwards and gave me the answer. I said, assume you've got a triangle. Does it ring any bells with any of you? And two of its angles, well, let's say they are 20 and 60. Therefore, the third angle will be a hundred, right? That's working one way. You've got a 20, you've got a 60, therefore the other one will be a hundred. But you can work backwards the other direction. This one is a hundred because, or for, the other two are 20 and 60. It's the same argument being looked at in the other direction. This is true, therefore that follows. This follows from that. It's just working in the other direction and Paul is using the word for or because. He's tying it in, all together. So where he's got his five thens or therefores, he's really added two more in the word for in chapters two and three. And then, of course, he says, you have died. That's there in chapter 2, so very plainly written in chapter 2, verse 20. You have died with him. And also, you were buried with him. And normally, we do bury people who are, who are dead. You were buried with him in baptism because you had died with him. And there in 2.20, with Christ, you have died to the elemental spirits it's all closely connected it's a new chapter but it flows on so very closely we should not think of a break and perhaps I shouldn't have started reading at chapter 3 in verse 1 but way back at chapter 2 and verse 6 because everything follows everything flows from that first therefore Paul we know is is dealing with the teachings from various false teachers that had come into Colossae and who were making, making things difficult for the believers there. Since you have come to faith, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, because you've received the gospel, you've understood the gospel, you realise the truth of the gospel, and it's had an impact on you and you have trusted Christ since this is true therefore so walk in him and all that follows on from that all from chapter 2 verse 6 through the rest of nearly all the rest of the letter is applying that statement you are a Christian 
live like one. You've recognised Jesus Christ as your Lord, your Saviour, your King, your Master, the one who redeemed you. Therefore, live in a way that is worthy of him. Live in a way that matches your profession. Walk in him. You've been redeemed in him, by him. You've been redeemed for him. Walk in him. Live a Christian life in him. A life that matches himself. So this, this golden paragraph is an integral part of Paul's argument against the false teachers. They were pointing away from Christ. They were pointing to rules and regulations. They were pointing to asceticism and, and other strange practices. And Paul is saying, no, look at Christ. He is the centre. He is the one who has given you a new life. He is the one who has given a new way of life. He's given you new attitudes, new desires, new thoughts. Christ is the centre. He's the, the be-all, the end-all of the life of a Christian. So you shouldn't be thinking about going off to various temples and doing this or that or submitting to regulations about food and what you can and what you can't do on what days of the week. And so think of Christ. Put him right at the centre of your life. These couple of chapters are full of Christ. Well over 30 references to our Lord Jesus Christ. It breathes Christ. It's, it's inundated with Christ because to Paul there is nothing, there is no one more important than the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you fix that in your mind, if you get that sorted out, then so many other problems that you might face will, will fall by the wayside. They will not have an impact on you because you are holding fast to the centre, to the core. Now admittedly in these, these four verses, he is, Paul is summarising much of what he said in chapter 2 and he's also leading up to what he's going to say in chapter 3. In verses 5 through to 17 there are, there are two lists of vices and one of virtues. Things that we need to put off and things that we need to put on. And then from verse 18 onwards, which we did not read, Paul is dealing with, with social relationships between believers or how believers react, respond, behave when they are dealing with other people. Now, having tried to put it all in its context to show that it's all flowing from chapter 2 and verse 6, therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Let's look a little bit at the structure of these first four verses. Obviously, he's starting off with the word if, and then he's got, you have been raised with Christ. Seek the things that are above where Christ is. He's told them to, to seek the things where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. He then, using slightly different word, says, set your minds on the things that are above. They're not identical, but you can see there is an overlap, and both are concerned with the things that are above. But this time, well, the first time he mentioned it, he, he spoke about where Christ is. Now he puts in a, a a different note. He says, not on the things that are of the earth. Again, he's getting a dig in at the false teachers who were so fixated on the things of this earth, though they seem to suggest otherwise. And then Paul says, for you died. 
He's mentioned you were raised. Now he's doing the other part, the other component. You were, you sorry, you died with Christ. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. And obviously, where is Christ? Where is God? These two persons of our blessed Trinity, we tend to think of them as being in heaven, above. Though, of course, heaven is, is not a place that is above in that sense. And then Paul goes on to talk about Christ being our life again. And when he appears, then all that we have in him, the fact that we are in him, all the wonderful experiences we have now of his love, of his grace and his mercy, will be seen in all their fullness and also the fact that we are his people we have been redeemed by him that will be revealed it might be hidden now the life of Christ within us but one day that life will be displayed across the universe so let's look more closely at these particular phrases if then you have been raised with Christ as I said earlier, it's the, it's the counterpart to chapter 2 and verse 20. If with Christ you died, if with Christ you have been raised, we died with Christ, we've been raised with Christ. Now by using the word if, he's not saying, I doubt, I really have my doubts about you, I'm not sure you lot are believers because of the way you're going on. He's not doing that. It's an if that says, I'm assuming that you are believers, that you are those who have been born again. You are those who have died with Christ and been raised with Christ and have the life of Christ within. But just for a moment, reflect on it. Just for a moment, examine yourself to make sure this actually is true of you I'm assuming it but we need you need to be certain of it Paul is talking of death and resurrection the whole experience you've died to the elemental spirits of this world you've died to the things of this earth and you've been raised with Christ. You are alive in Christ. There has been this, well, total, total switch, total change and transformation. Recently I had to uh, do a switch for my brother in his energy supplier. It's not too difficult these days. You just contact one and you contact the other and say goodbye and, and hello. And it's all done for you in the background. Now once it's finished, what claim does your old energy supplier have on you? None. Are you going to pay them? No. You're still using energy, but you're not going to pay them. You are not going to deal with them. You have no, they will have no impact upon you. You're now with a new company. And that new company means you have a new relationship, new expectations, new implications. Your direct debit or whatever goes to a different place. Once you were dead, you have died with Christ to this world. That's the old company. And now you've got a new company. You're alive in Christ. You've died to this world, this world's religion, the hollow, deceptive thing. All its rules and regulations and all its ideas and teachings. They're past, they're gone forever. Instead, you have been raised to a new world, a new faith, an effective faith. You've been raised to a new realisation. Your eyes have actually been opened to see things that are real. More important, more long lasting than the things of this world. The things that we can touch and feel. Did not Paul say 
that when you all the things that you can see all the things that you can touch they're transient they're going to pass away it's only the spiritual things of Christ that will last through eternity so you have new experiences the experience of being free you're free from sin you're no longer under its dominion under its claim you're not obviously therefore going to receive the judgment that goes with sin you're freed from the darkness we've got the light of the world Christ within you are freed from from Satan's uh, clutches You've been transferred from the domain of darkness, that, that of Satan, and you've been transferred into the kingdom of Christ. It's new. Paul often talks about the Lord Jesus Christ and contrasts him with Adam, made by God for the Garden of Eden. In Adam... Paul would say, you died. We all died in Adam. But in Christ, we've been made alive. We've been changed from those who are Adam's people into those who are Christ's people. That process partly has been accomplished if you can remember when Adam ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God said to him, in that day you will die. He died spiritually. His body, he lived on bodily, physically, for many, many centuries. In just the same way, when we are joined to our Lord Jesus Christ, our situation, our spiritual situation is dealt with. Though, of course, we live on in our bodies and one day we'll die unless the Lord Jesus Christ returns. If then with Christ you were raised, you were raised for a purpose. God didn't just do it for no purpose at all. He raised you for a purpose. And that purpose look back into chapter 1 verses 9 and 10 he wants you to live a life that is worthy of God that matches up to the character of God to the person of God your life, my life is meant to be a mirror image of God's own life seen in the Lord Jesus Christ we are to reflect him we are to live lives that are worthy of him and ultimately, one of the things that God is going to do is to present us holy and blameless and without reproach before him. That's the goal for you and me, if we are Christians. That one day we will stand before the, the judgment throne of God and he'll say, you're perfect, you're holy. Come, come and enjoy eternity with me a glorious thought God has done that because he has that in mind for his people the false teachers their ideas of pleasing God were never ever going to achieve what they hoped they were a total and utter failure but we've been raised with Christ for a purpose so we might glorify him, so we might bring him honour and praise. But then the question, of course, arises, how on earth are you going to do that? How will you achieve that? And Paul gives us two aspects, describes two things that will enable us to move along that path of seeking to glorify our Heavenly Father. But there's one thing you need to, to note in English, the next two parts both start with the verb, seek the things that are above. Set your minds on the things that are above. And to us, the stress is on the seek. 
set your minds on. That's not what Paul wrote. That's not where he's putting the emphasis. Because he turned it round the other way. The things that are above, see. The things that are above, set your minds on. He's not focusing on the process, he's focusing on the content. And there's a big difference. We all seek, we all set our minds on things. But the important thing is, on what are you going to set your minds? On what are you going to seek in this life? The stress is there on the content, not on the, not on the seeking and the setting. But first of all, we, we can say they are very similar. They're not identical. If Paul had wanted to say the same thing, he could have said the same thing. But he deliberately chose different words under the inspiration of the Spirit. They're not identical, but there is a big, big overlap. If you have got some other versions of the Scriptures, some of them do translate seek the things that are above as set your heart on. But it doesn't actually say that. They're trying to bring out a, a, a nuance that is there by using very, very similar words to the second phrase. Seek. Now again, what comes to your mind when you're told to seek? To me, it's the picture of, I'm due out in five minutes and where are the car keys? And I start to look for them. And I can go frantic looking for them. Trying to turn over, well, I turn everything upside down. I've got to find them. Where are those keys? I'm seeking, desperately seeking to find them. Putting all my energy into finding them. But Paul isn't saying that either. You see, when he's saying seek, he, it's not that we are trying to obtain something. Because we already have these things. We already have the spiritual blessings that come through Christ. We already have the benefits of salvation. We do not have to seek them anymore. They're there. We have them because we are with Christ. We, were di we died with Christ. We've been raised with Christ. And all these blessings are in Christ. And we, we are in him. We've got them all. So how can we seek them, Paul? What do you mean by seeking them? What he's saying is all these things that you know about, I want you to make sure that you line yourself up with them. That you align yourself with the things that are to be sought. Orient yourself your attitudes, your ambitions, your outlook on life, your decision making, your interests, your desires. Seek to line them up with what do you know about God himself. Don't stray from that path. Don't go down a different direction. Line up. Seek to make sure that your life lines up with the things that are above. Everything about you, everything about me, every part of our character and our lives should be moulded by the fact that we belong to Christ. Our allegiance is directed to him. And that means that if we are uh, have that allegiance to him, we do not transfer it to someone else or something else. We seek to do what he commands. We seek to match up our actions with his will. God doesn't call us to escape from this world in, in doing those things. He calls us to be obedient in this world. And the more we know about our Lord Jesus Christ, 
The more we love our Lord Jesus Christ, the more we should be seeking to display his life in the way we live, by our choices, by our attitudes, by our decisions, by our outlook on life. Match up yourself with what you know about things above. But he also says to set your minds. Paul in Romans 8 talks a great deal about this and the contrast there is between setting your minds on the things of the earth and the things that are above. I'll just read a few verses uh, from Romans 8. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. There's that contrast. Where are you going to set your minds? In which direction are your thoughts going to flow? With what will you line up? The things of the earth, the fleshly things, or the things of the Spirit, the things that are above and there are many other verses in that, in that uh, chapter that, will, that bring out the same, same idea. But when we set our minds, is that, that's a deliberate thing, isn't it? Can you remember Jesus Christ? He set his face to go towards Jerusalem. That was a deliberate decision. I'm going to Jerusalem. I know that there I shall be crucified, but I am going. You cannot distract me. You cannot divert me. That is where I go. And we must be just like that and set our minds on that which we need to do upon God's purpose, upon God's will. As we understand the truth of the scriptures, we, well, if we understand this truth, then we cannot, we cannot live for this world, for the things of this world. Because they are things that, that don't please us. They are things that don't really attract us. They are things that don't satisfy. They are things that we recognise are, are passing. Does it matter if your football team won yesterday or not in the eternal scheme of things? Does it matter if you live in a big house or a small house when eternity is here? What does matter? You must be thinking about the fact that you belong to Christ. Think it through. If I am Christ's, what are the conclusions I must draw? What are the consequences of setting my mind on things that are above? Peter, in his first letter, wrote, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. You belong to Christ. Christ suffered. What does that mean you may experience? Think it through. Work it out. Realise the consequences. We need to be filling our minds with the things that are, well, need to have the right thoughts. What is important? What is not important? Hold on to the important and, and let the, the unimportant, the unnecessary, just let those things fade away. They're not going to have that much of an impact upon you. Or they should not have that impact. Think about where you're heading what is your goal in life? What are your ambitions? What do you hope to achieve? Well, right behind all of them should be the thought, I'm destined for glory. I'm headed for heaven. Therefore, I will live in the right way. I will set my mind on the right things. 
I came across a hymn by Thomas Gibbons. Now let our souls on wings sublime rise from the vanities of time. Draw back the parting veil and see the glories of eternity. Twice born by a, by a celestial birth, why should we grovel here on earth? Why grasp at this world's passing toys when we have heaven's eternal joys? Get things in their proper perspective. Set your minds on the things that are important, the things that really matter. And all the time, recognise what you already have. Don't be distracted. Don't let yourself, the hymn goes on, shall we be sidetracked on the road when we are travelling back to God? From exile into life we come. And to dying is but going home. Can you imagine... A man who's been away for a month on a business trip. This is obviously and not a lockdown scenario. In Australia and lands at Manchester Airport. And, well, what will be his first thought? Oh, I'd better go to the shops and, and uh, see if there's anything I fancy. Or gets out and gets a taxi and says to him, Oh, um, will you go to Morrison's? I need a loaf of bread or, or some milk and, and I can do with a few. What's his first thought? home. I want to get home. It's the most important thing for me to do is to get home. What's the most important thing for us? On what are we setting our minds? On what are we seeking? You are going to set your minds. You are going to be seeking. But on what? Is it going to be on the things that are above? Or the things of this world, the things of this earth, the things that are here today and one day will be gone. This light momentary affliction, Paul says, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And that's where we're heading, and therefore that's the thing upon which we should be focusing. That's the life that we should be exhibiting. I'm setting my heart. I'm setting my mind. I'm seeking the things that are above. Yes, I can enjoy the things of the earth. Yes, I can enjoy a good meal. I'm sure Paul enjoyed good food. But it wasn't his first objective. He would never say, oh, I must have this meal. I won't go and talk to those people outside. I've got to eat first. He would be out there talking because that was more important. It was an eternal matter. And his meal, though important to him, to his body, was in second place. Things above. My time is running out. I will not uh, develop this in any way because, God willing, next time I'll be contrasting the things that are above that we have here in verse 2 with the things that are described later. The things that are on earth. And showing how they differ and in what way they differ and how we should be dealing with one and dealing with the other. But in essence, the things above are where Christ is. And he, is he not the one whom our souls love? Do we not want to be with him? Do we not want to be like him? One day we shall be. The scripture makes that perfectly clear. We will, that God, our Lord Jesus Christ, will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. That was Paul. John, the Apostle John, beloved, we are God's children now 
and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. There's that prospect held out to all those who are Christians, that one day we shall be like Christ, one day we shall be with Christ, one day we shall be sinless, all the effects of sin will have been wiped away, because we have been united with Christ in his death. And because we've been united, we are with Christ in his resurrection. On what are you thinking? On what are you, for what are you going? Where's your ambition? What's your goal? Are you setting your heart on things that are above? Is that your prime purpose in life? Or are you filling yourself with the things that are transient, that come and go? The danger, of course, is that if your mind is set on the things of the earth, if you are seeking the things of the earth, then it really does call into question, have you been raised with Christ? Have you been born again? When he died, did he die for you? Your life should give the answer to that question.